The New York Islanders roster is pretty much set and the cap space is fairly limited, but does Lou Lamorello have enough tricks up his sleeve to tinker with this roster enough to drastically improve them from what they were last season? Another edition of the Edgework Offseason Previews continues and today covering the New York Islanders and nobody better to help us break down this roster and look ahead to next season than Michael Leboff. Uh, Michael, how's it going? How's your summer been and uh, are you excited for this Islanders offseason? Summer's good so far. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's always fun. Uh, I mean, you know, too, from being a, a Lou team, it's fun because you just have no idea what's going yeah. on and you, so you could just wake up one morning uh, and you know, Bo Horvat could be on your team with with very little warning, <laughs> or you could just go an entire summer with everyone telling you that Nas Kadri is like getting tours of schools and uh, you know looking at property on Long Island uh, just to have him sign with the Flames. And uh, so it could go in a million different directions. I think most people overlook the Islanders partly because of that, like it's in terms of like a general hockey like mainstream narrative. Mm -hmm. The Islanders look pretty boring and I get it. Um, But the fact that Lou is in charge makes them, I think, much more intriguing than they would be if if someone more uh, normal was. So uh, I'm pretty pumped. I I think that that he has a couple of surprises up his sleeve. He didn't talk to the media uh, for like five weeks after the Islanders got eliminated from the playoffs (laughs) for no reason. Uh, I love that he was still needling people like that. So, um, yeah, Lou, Lou's, Lou's the best. He cracks me up. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, like, as you kind of mentioned there, with the Lou-led team, you kind of feel like you're in the dark at all times. And it feels like even people around the organization at times are just in the dark. They don't even know. It's one of those ones where if if they don't find out, then nobody else outside of there can. It just eliminates all possibilities of any leaks. But I wanted to know your thoughts just even briefly on that whole waiting period to hear from him at the end of the season. Obviously, here in Toronto, we basically heard immediately, and it was, for lack of better words, a shitstorm and that was just expected out of here but like i just remember listening to the radio even during that period of time while there was a chaos in toronto and they're like look at new york like we haven't even heard from lou this guy hasn't even said anything (laughs) what what was going on through your mind what just lou was just lurking in the shadows waiting to for his time to speak yeah i mean well first of all i i didn't really mind the the silence because we got to enjoy uh the shitstorm oh, yeah. in Toronto, right? Like we got to <laughs> yeah. just watch that all unfold. So it's not like I needed Islanders news to to give me my hockey fix. Um, but I, I mean, I was fine with it because I've I've kind of learned to uh, just appreciate Lou as as a, an entertainer more than anything. Like he, the hockey is a sport. You're supposed to watch it. It's supposed to add to your life. And he yeah. is in charge. And I can't, you know, if I don't just because I don't agree with something he does doesn't mean I can't be like, all right, this guy's out. This guy's in. Uh, so you just learn to kind of ride with with the waves of uh, of Lou and uh, the this one was both funny because you could see it coming and also it's it's yeah. so bizarre that he did it at the same time because he had nothing to say anyways it's like yeah <laughs> he, he didn't he didn't change the coach he didn't he he his contract was apparently up but he snapped at a reporter a few months ago for suggesting that he was he didn't have a contract uh, for next season. Um, <laughs> Nobody knows anything. I remember talking to someone uh, prior to the offseason last year, or excuse me, two seasons ago, when it was basically known they'd signed Parisi, they'd re-signed Palmieri, and re-signed Beauvillier, but they just never let anybody know what the... They never announced it. Um, and this guy is very well connected, told me that the reason he does it is because he doesn't want other GMs to know how much cap space they have. Uh, so <laughs> it's like a loophole where, look, you could, you don't have to announce anything. Like, I think your yeah. rosters are due like September 20th or whatever. So he used that to his advantage and, uh, didn't, didn't let anyone know how much cap space he had. Nobody knew what Beauvillier, Sorokin, Palmieri signed for. So, uh, and Parisi. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've just learned to enjoy it. I know it picks, pisses a lot of Islanders fans off because you want to be able to, to have like tangible things to talk about. Is this a bad contract or a good contract? What do you think about this? Okay, now we have this much cap space. But at the same time, I I love it because you just you wake like I said, you wake up the next morning and and you might make a big trade for for Eric Carlson or something. Right, right. Well, we're talking about hockey's man of mystery and Lou Lamorello leading the charge there uh, with the New York Islanders. But today you're going to be stepping into Lou's shoes and building out the New York Islanders roster for next season. So. 
Let's start here with the restricted free agents. We're obviously going to touch on mostly just the guys that you think are going to join the big club here. There's one guy that sticks out in particular. That would be Oliver Wallstrom. Uh, but outside of uh, or that included, is there anyone on this restricted free agents list for the New York Islanders that you're looking to bring back, you're going to prioritize here, or anybody else outside of Wallstrom that you think might be able to join the big club next year? No, it's just Wallstrom. I mean, I think they'll they'll end up re-signing uh, Jacob uh, Skarik as their their minor league goalie. Uh, but they they also they just signed Tristan Lennox, I believe his name is, to a, an entry level deal. And uh, I think Corey Schneider's moved on, so that's the only one I can right. see even coming in. So it's just Wallstrom here. All right. So bringing back Wallstrom, is there any projections that you have on what his contract might be, term, cap hit, anything like that? So this is where the Lou stuff comes in because he's been really right. <laughs> good at, at getting people to sign very fair contracts, uh, whether it's Pellick or Pollock. I mean, going back to Everly and Brock Nelson. Um, yeah. I remember when Brock resigned with the Islanders uh, four or five years ago. Now he was he was up at the same time as Kevin Hayes, and the Islanders signed Nelson to a a six million dollar AAV. And everybody was like, "Why would you give that money to Brock Nelson when you could have given it to Kevin Hayes?" And it's turned out to be you know a very good choice by the Islanders. Um, so I, I mean, I think he comes in. It's he, he's also incredibly hard to project because he's coming off of a season where he tore his ACL, and it was yeah. last season was supposed to be his prove it season, um, and he never he didn't really do it. So I'm looking at what he, they signed Kiefer Bellows to last year. I think Wallstrom's ceiling is much higher than Bellows was, but it it, it was the same kind of th- thing where a guy kind of coming off of a he was supposed to have a prove it year didn't do it. Um, I still had RFA rights and, and Lamorello signed him just north of a million. I think it's like 1.4 here for Wallstrom would be fair. I think some projections will have him higher than that. Um, but like I said, this is, this is Lou. So I don't, I don't think that he's going to be, uh, you know, negotiated into something crazy from, from a player who played 35 games last year and scored seven goals when he's supposed to be a, a goal scorer. No, definitely not. If there's anything we know about Lou, it's that he's not going to going to be giving in to any players on any contract negotiations or anything like that. He's going to be set in stone, and I think that's the right way to go about it. So uh, we'll lock him in there at 1.4 mil, and then was that one year on the term for him there? Yeah, I think it'll end up being one. Uh, they'll they'll just like I said, it's going to look like uh, like the the Bellows situation from last year. It's it's also a situation where. Um, like with with Wallstrom, they they needed him much more before last season, I think, than they do this year, uh, because uh, of a couple of of other free agents who, or or acquisitions they've made since, you know, Horvat and Engwell. Um, like I just right. don't think that they're desperately they desperately need a, a twenty goal score goal scoring season from from Oliver Wallstrom uh, as much as they did before last year. All right, so if you got a sneak peek there, you see the roster for the Islanders of next season. We're at 21 in the roster size, $3.936 million of cap space currently available. And as far as the team construction goes, I mean, we're talking about 21 of 23 roster spaces currently taken up. It is fairly filled out as of right now, but this likely isn't the team that you're looking to go into just as is with next into next season. You do have some spots available on the defensive side and you're looking for at least a backup goalie, whether that's a guy coming up from the minors or going out and signing one in free agency. But to do these things, you're going to need to open up some space. So where would you be looking to open up cap space and roster space on this Islanders team going into next season throughout this summer? Yeah, the, the Islanders first order of business will be to, trade josh bailey which is going to be heartbreaking because it's been such a fun journey with bailey since he was drafted uh 28 uh, 2008 and uh has had a ridiculously wild kind of up and down career with the islanders the, half the fan base loves him half the fan base has wanted to trade him every chance that they could um but he's gonna finish third all time like when the islanders trade him it looks it looks pretty certain that they will He's going to be third all time in games played and like top 10 in assists and points for this team, which is right. you know, wild when you consider this was their 50th season and he's Josh Bailey. So, uh, yeah, that that kind of plays into the complications with him. You're not just trying to trade, right? This isn't Andrew Ladd, like trying, you're not really okay with just trading Josh Bailey to Arizona or, uh, you know, a, a rebuilding team like Anaheim or San Jose because Lou, Lou even said in his press conference, the only, thing that he he actually like kind of divulged information about was uh that he wants to do right by josh and 
uh, find him like a good spot. You could see Chicago, but at the same time, I think that he's still useful enough to a team like, let's say the Blackhawks where he comes in. This is a guy who's been in the league forever. He can slot in pretty well with a player like Connor Bedard, or at least, you know, be on the same roster as him and you provide that, you know, veteran leadership. Uh, he's also still, I think, talented enough that a bounce back season from him wouldn't be crazy to expect. And then the Blackhawks could then flip him at the deadline. Um, right. So you look at it like are the, the Blackhawks could just be buying uh, a, dra- a draft pick for for ne- the next draft by trading for him. So I don't think it's going to, I originally thought it was going to cost the Islanders a lot more to, to get his number off the books, but it's just one year. Uh, so I think that the Islanders will be able to do it for like, you know, future fourth round pick, maybe like a third round pick um, in, in one of the next couple drafts. But uh, I, I just don't think it's going to be that difficult uh, to get Bailey uh, off the books, at least not as difficult as I thought it was going to be uh, coming into the summer, just, just by like thinking about the, the situation. Right. So to get this off the books here, what specific uh, you're looking at Chicago. What specific trade package exactly are we putting together to send to Chicago, get him off the books, and get rid of that money? Yeah, so it would be Bailey and the Islanders. Um, they ha- they don't have a uh, a third round pick again till 2025. So it would maybe I would say it would cost like the fourth a fourth round pick this year. Um, okay. Would would I still think we get it done? It's enough, I think, for for Chicago. Considering, like I said, they they'll be able to. S- to trade Bailey again for another pick. Yeah. You, you, you're taking away another draft pick from, from this upcoming draft, which apparently is, is deep, but uh, I think that that should be enough for, for a player that's, that's useful and, and a team that I think has use for uh, a player, even at that cap hit. And what are you getting back here in this trade? You know, future assets or something. One of those, one of those beautiful future considerations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of those beautiful, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, just take this contract off the books for us. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. The, <laughs> okay. the only other situation I could see uh, is that, you know, they, they end up trading him for a, 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 a another team's problem contract that has right. term to it. Right. And, um, right. but I think this is much more realistic that it just ends up being Bailey and a, and a mid round pick uh, to, to a team like Chicago. Did you hear something that might be getting you excited about betting on the NHL next season? Maybe you want to get into the futures markets, whether it be conferences or divisions, or you're looking to bet on the Stanley Cup. Well, Pinnacle Sportsbook is the place to do it because Pinnacle is the world's sharpest sportsbook. You can find out what professional bettors have known for decades. Pinnacle is where the best bettors play. You must be 19 plus and in Ontario, not available to customers in the U.S. So thank you to our sponsor over at Pinnacle. Make sure to go and sign up there. It is the world's sharpest sports book. Well, there you go. Now you're sitting at $8.9 million of cap space here. Roster size of 20 here. What is the next moves that you're going to be looking to make? Is there any big holes that you're trying to fill at this point in time? Are you just trying to add some depth pieces? Are there any big names out there in free agency that you're going to be targeting? If you're in the shoes of Lou Lamorello, obviously very hard to predict exactly what he's going to be doing himself. But uh, if this is you, you're running the Islanders. Where do you go from here this summer? What is the next move that you're going to make? Yeah, I think the the first thing they're going to do, and I think this one might actually be the one that's announced first, is uh, they'll they'll – bring back Simeon Varlamov uh, to tandem with uh, Sorokin for, for two. It sounds like a two year deal. I, that would be my guess as well. You know, two, two times 2.5 Varlamov kind of cu- catches a bad break here with the way the goal, goaltender market is setting up where uh, perhaps if he was a UFA last year, he could have gotten a pretty big deal because he would have been one, uh, near the top of the list. But with Connor Hellebuck out there as a trade potential, even you yeah. Saros, uh, then talking about like John Gibson and uh, they're just a bunch of goalies out there uh, that I think Varlamov ends up being kind of thrown under the radar, which I don't know if he minds. He's 35. He likes being on long Island. Him and Sorokin are are really tight uh, Russian goalies. And um, I don't think Varlamov's going out there looking for a 40 game, you know, a a chance to play 40 games a season anymore. He think he likes his, his role with the Islanders. Uh, His family lives here uh, for during the season. So, uh, I don't think he's he's trying to upset the apple cart here. So Varley, Varley back at like half, like I said, half his hit from previous years is uh, seems to me like a no brainer. The Islanders are strong 
in two very sp- important positions, right? They're, they're strong down the middle and they're going to be strong in goal. So why try to screw with that? Yeah. Makes complete sense there. Now looking at some of the other uh, unrestricted free agents from this Islanders team last year, heading into this summer, you're looking at a couple guys. One you acquired at the deadline there, Pierre Engvall. You got Scott Mayfield, uh, Zach Parise kind of kicking around. Are there any guys leaving this team or having their contracts expire from this Islanders team from last season that you're sitting there kind of saying, hey, I'd like to have that guy back or thinking maybe we, they should be bringing those guys back? Yeah, we'll start with the easy one. Uh, Parisi, I think it's it's up to him if he wants to come back and play for the Islanders again. I think he will. He'll take that veteran minimum. He's already getting, what, $10 million a year from Minnesota regardless. Yeah. So he'll play for the veteran minimum again. He uh, his he said it's up to his family. His family's s- still in, in Minnesota. Uh, so it's just about if he's there, okay, with him playing another season, um, I think that it'll end up, he'll end up coming back. He, 21 goals last year everybody on long island loves this guy like he's his dad played here the fact that they didn't draft him in 2003 2003 they passed passed on him to to draft robert nelson was a a mistake that was corrected by lou the guy who drafted him uh so i think he'll be back mayfield i think is going to end up catching a pretty big ticket here uh from someone else which means that the islanders are going to have a a hole on right d um and it'll, it'll be tough to fill because uh, you're looking at you know, a pretty thin UFA core, but uh, there's just no way that they're going to be able to, to pay Scott Mayfield. I think he's going to get four, yeah. maybe four and a half million dollars. So uh, a good soldier, a guy that everybody here loves, great playoff guy. Your Leafs were rumored to be kicking his tires for, for a while there. Um, yep. <laughs> and we'll see. We'll see if he ends up going there. But um, speaking of, I think Gangval will actually – come back Lou Lou I feel like Lou doesn't trade for guys he doesn't think he can bring back right like he's already done it with Pajot he's done it with Palmieri uh whether or not Engvall kind of fits that same bill is remains to be seen but uh, this is a guy who came here and and played a role that he wouldn't get uh on a team like Toronto because what do the Islanders have you know they're over indexed on guys who play hard who who play with like grit and toughness and and they they forecheck they make life miserable Angval isn't really that player but the islanders need guys you know for for lack of a better term like they they need those kind of finesse players that's those are the type of players they don't have so whereas Angval right. a- added just more finesse to a finesse team with toronto like he adds finesse to a team that was begging for it and i think that his role uh on long island is he, he might not get a better one unless he goes to a team that's not going to contend, you know, like, like the Chicago's of the world where he can play, you know, first line minutes and be like Andreas at the CU type player for, for them, like a, a first line player on a bad team. But uh, I think he'll come back. I think a four year deal at like three and a half to 4 million. We'll say four just because, you know, he's, it is his first true, true time, uh, first time hitting UFA. So I'm sure he'll, he'll want to get that, that as big a ticket as can. Uh, so to keep right. it realistic, I would say four four times four for Angval, which might be a little bit pricey for what uh, Islander fans are hoping for. But that would be uh, my best guess on on his cap hit with, with once again, the Lulu factor looming large. Okay, so covering some of the big free agents who are expiring from this Islanders team, you bring back Varlamov, bring back Engvall, currently looking at cap. Uh, obviously, this is assuming Parise will uh, decide to play again, bring him back on the league minimum there. Uh, for the veteran league minimum, you got $1.6 million of cap space. There's not too much that has to go on in terms of additions here, but we do still have a little bit of room uh, in terms of maybe some depth or wherever you're going to be looking around there. Is there anyone else that you might be looking to add? Are you trying to keep the roster as is, or do you kind of see everyone on the screen here as being part of this team going into next season? Yeah. The, the only other guy I think that is tradable is Pajot. He's got a, a, a modified no trade clause. I think he saw some, some significant value around the league, but I don't yeah. think that the Islanders are going to do it. Uh, okay. I think that Lou likes going, he's going to let going into the season with, with these five centers, he'll have Barzell on the wing with Horvat uh, on that that first line. See how that works, and then go from there. the The way that they would make room uh, from this situation would be either uh, putting Ross Johnston on waivers or or sending down Simon Holmstrom, who will still be on a uh, 
on a two way deal. So that could, that'll get them to like two and a half million uh, or close to 3 million in space. And the one right D that I think that the Islanders have a chance of, of getting here and, and signing. And realistically he fills a need uh, is Connor Clifton. Like the Islanders don't need another Scott Mayfield type. They need someone who can kind of move the puck a little bit, skate it. And Clifton, he's got, still has got an edge. He's, he's a UFA. He's a right D he's, the Islanders will be familiar with him. He's from the area. Uh, he's not going to hit. If you look at his like offensive output, for for example, it's very similar to Mayfield. He can kill penalties. Uh, and I think that putting him on, on a third pair with a defense that already has Adam Pellick and, and Ryan Pollock uh, kind of locking down that, that top pair, you'd hope for a bounce back season uh, from, from Noah Dobson as well. And then I think Sebastian Ajo yeah. is, is, is starting to, to get some, just put his career together too. So I think now you're starting to to have a, a really logistical or a realistic spot for, for Clifton as, as a number six D on that right side. Okay. And if you are looking to sign him here, what do you project his cap hit might, might be coming into this team? Is this a signing that we also want to make here or is this just a, um, a guide to maybe keep an eye out for? I think it's, it's a little bit of both. It's, it's someone that I think is, is realistic. Like I'm not going to go say, like for for the right D I would love is, you know, I I would like John Klingberg on the Islanders. I would love Eric Carlson on the Islanders. I'd love Justin Falk on the Islanders as a right D because the Islanders need someone to provide some cover for uh, Noah Dobson. If he truly can't run a power play, which it looked like he couldn't do last year, the season before that he did. So we'll see. Um, So to have that kind of power play quarterback would be nice. I just don't think that they're going to be able to afford it unless they trade Pajot. And like I said, I don't, I, I don't think they're going to. So if they sign Clifton, I think he'll come in. He's, he's, he'll get a raise. He's, he was one, uh, you know, a $1 million player last year. I think you're, you're looking at a, a like a three times two uh, contract would, would get it done. And like I said, then you just can easily finagle your way uh, with the, you know, the, the Holmstrom kind of uh, you can send down Holmstrom. You can do whatever with, with Ross Johnston, you can put him on waivers uh, and the Islanders would have uh, more than enough space to make it work, and they already get they'll have their seven D as well because they've already signed Sam Boldick. So um, there you go. It's 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 a as you guys like to say up there. It's a it's a definitely a, it feels like a run it back season. But I don't if we're being realistic, I just don't see another way that the Islanders can go. Yeah, I think that this Islanders team, honestly, I think that the way that they're built, the way that they play, at least. Um, they're set up very well and you have an incredible goaltender back there for you. I think one thing that they lacked last year, the one way I kind of described them was that they would wait for you to make mistakes and then capitalize on those mistakes. But oftentimes they just weren't able to capitalize enough. Maybe if that's the right way to put it. And I think with some, with getting Barzell back for a full season, having Horvat here for a full season, that's a very different look. It's a very different uh, chemistry that starts to be built between these guys and with this team. And if you have it for a full season, it can actually start to feel very different despite being very much the same or very similar, yep. I guess, would be the better way to put it. So I don't think that there needs to be major changes here. And the other thing I would always just say is when you have a goalie or goalie tandem, at least, like you guys have there in Sorokin and Varlamov, it, it's kind of hard to go wrong with that kind of setup back there. So. Yeah, I think yeah, and this team's built well. Like you said, like they, they barely got to see Horvat and Barzell play together, so we yeah. just we have no idea what that's going to be like. Uh, and one of the big issues that got overlooked last year was when when they traded for Horvat and Barzell got hurt. JG Pajot was also hurt at the same time, so the Islanders went from having five centers to having two, and Horvat was playing this yeah. ridiculous role of being a third line center and also a first line center, and it was it was just way too much. Uh, for him and I think it slowed him down but yeah I I do think that we're not idiots like we know that this team needs would love Alex to bring it or they would love to get someone like that who can completely you know change the face of the offense but they just it's not realistic for them to be able to do it in my mind well if I wake up tomorrow and yeah they make it work like that's great but I I'm not going into the season holding my breath like I did with Kadri and Goudreau last year Uh, I made that mistake already so i'm just you know connor clifton to me get me connor clifton and and i'll sleep fine at night so yeah that's the thing you wake up tomorrow with lou as your gm you find out that trade's being made you're you're partially surprised and then at the same time you're also just not because you're like oh well yeah it was lou he's guy was lurking in the shadows making this happen but 
assuming we send down uh, Holmstrom here, you're sitting at 525k of cap space right now. You got max roster size 23. Let's just go through and construct what you would like to see the lines looking like in this depth chart of this Islanders team going into next season. Yeah, so Horvat would be um, up there in that number one center spot with Barzell on his wing. Uh, you can then put Nelson, you'd move up all the centers. So it's Nelson, Pajot, uh, Sezikis down the middle. Uh, it would be, of course, a, a cardinal sin to separate. You're not, you're not allowed to separate Sezikis, Clutterbuck, and, and Martin from one another. So they'd be the fourth line. Although like ide- the ideal fourth line to me would be um, with Fashing and, and Parisi with Sezikis, but the Islanders are, are not going to do that until you know one of these guys just falls apart. Ross Johnston, he he, I mean, he's had one of the most bizarre NHL careers you can imagine. The, he's been on the team and uh, basically on this roster since 2015, 16, I believe, um, and he's played maybe 100 games. Uh, they just keep him around. The guys like him. If the Islanders need to put him in the lineup to make sure that Nick Delorier doesn't like cheap shot Matt Barzell or something. If it's like 1983 or so, like all over again, <laughs> they, they put him in, uh, but otherwise he'd, he'd be, you know, in, in the press box as well. So you can flip him down there and you can, uh, you can put Engvall in the second line, him, Nelson and Palmieri were really good together. And then it's, it's going to be a battle. I think it'll, it'll be an interesting battle between um, Parisi will probably play with Pajot. Those two, to, those two work to, well together. Um, and then I think Walsham would have the inside track over fashing, uh, in, in that third line, but it, it it's an interesting debate because Fashing was was really good. I just think his role fits much more as that fourth line responsible winger uh, with with Suzikis and someone else. Uh, but the like I said, the Islanders just will never break up uh, the the best fourth line in hockey from from twenty nineteen. Yeah. So <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. All right, so there you go. The forwards are done. Uh, obviously, you're going to be looking at Sorokin, your number one guy, Varlamov, backing him up. That makes sense there. Now looking over to the D, any changes you would make in terms of who these pairings are, the orders that they're in? No, I think that that'll end up being, if if, if they did sign someone like Connor Clifton, this would probably end up being what it is. I think uh, you, there's a chance that you'd, you'd flip Aho with, with Clifton, depending on who Dobson can play with. He, he seemed to kind of have trouble with everybody towards the end of last season, but... Uh, we still have faith in him to, to kind of be that offensive defenseman that he showed uh, in the last season under Barry Trotz. So I think this is this is about it. And uh, Sebastian Ajo will be your um, you know breakout defenseman in the NHL this season. All right, I like it. I like the prediction. That is the, your New York Islanders for 2023, 2024. Uh, currently, you close out with 525 thousand dollars of cap space you write to the roster size of 23 now michael uh obviously when i sit here and say what are your expectations for next year everyone is going to say well no duh you're trying to win the stanley cup i understand that but based on where you go from last year now you're going to add these guys in it's basically a free uh pickup in terms of barzell adding him in for a full season kind of thing having guys be healthy now you're going to bring back Pierre Engvall. You're going to make minor to little changes here to your team. What are some reasonable expectations for the New York Islanders, maybe say regular season, and then just kind of progression into Stanley Cup uh, playoffs of next season? What are your expectations of this team? Yeah, I, I would like to say that they make it a little more comfortable making it to the playoffs. They don't have to depend on Peter Mrazek beating the Pittsburgh Penguins on the third to last night of the uh, the season next year. That would be nice. I still can't believe that happened um but I, I i think with the way so much of it matters so much of it is is about your division and i think that the metro is going to actually be a little bit of a mess for the first time in a while uh yeah. next season i think you have obviously the flyers are going to be bad the blue jackets i don't think they might be better but i don't think that they're they're going to make up the 40 points whatever they needed to 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 be a contender in this division um the the rangers have questions about depth i think that you know they, they have some cap gymnastics that they're gonna have to play they also you know didn't really inspire much confidence uh at all last year teams a, another year older washington and pittsburgh i think are we can it's maybe it's unfair to lump them together but that's the natural thing to do and i don't really see either one of them improving all that much maybe you know i know pittsburgh missed the playoffs by what one point or two points but Still, uh, they got 82 games out of Crosby and 82 games out of Malkin next year. So I don't think so. I think the Islanders can can realistically say that 
they can be the number three team in this division um, behind New Jersey and Carolina. And Car- like, who knows with Carolina? They need to sign two goalies or one, and yeah. then they'll have a rookie, right? Like, they're they're not a, a sure thing either. Um, you look at the betting board. I agree that the Devils uh, and, and Hurricanes are, should be the two favorites, but I don't think that when you look at the odds, the Islanders should be in the 50 to one range. If the Rangers are 14 to one and the, the, you know, the Penguins are much higher than them. So uh, I think that, you know, third place in the division is a realistic expectation with the, the ceiling of, of challenging for, for home ice in, in round one. All right. There you have it. There is our New York Islanders off season preview. Michael, thank you for taking the time to do this. If you're looking for more content from Michael, you can find him doing NHL soccer and darts for the action network, as well as the Islanders anxiety podcast. So if you want just specific Islanders talk, that's a place to go and find it. Um, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Enjoy the off season. And uh, hopefully we get to see you back here on this Edgework channel at some point uh, in the next year. You got it. Thanks again to Michael Lieboff for joining the Edgework Offseason Previews. If you enjoyed the content here today, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as turn on notifications so you get notified every single time we go live here for daily picks and previews or more videos just like this off-season preview come out in the future as well. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below about the trades that were made, the signings that were made, as well as what your predictions are for the New York Islanders next season. We'll see you guys throughout the rest of the summer.